I'm a linguist. As far as I know, we linguists do not really know what the language is as opposed to a dialect. There are no real criteria for distinguishing uh, languages from dialects, and that's a problem. Some people seem to know, those who issued the Lewis decree apparently knew, since they told us that Ukrainian is a language that did not, does not, and cannot exist, and that it is instead the dialect used by commoners, and it's just the Russian language, only corrupted by the influence of Poland. Uh, quite interesting statement, and I think it uh, serves to be um, challenged. Um, not only do we not really know what a dialect and what a language is, um, contemporaries didn't know either. Karas Koznarski uh, just pointed out that the terminology was a little bit fuzzy in the Ukrainian context, but I can confirm that this was not only a problem in the Russian Empire, and it did not only apply to Ukrainian. Uh, don't forget that um, the key figure of Slavic uh, cultural history, Jan Kolar, still wrote about four main dialects of the Slavic language. So everything becomes quite difficult. And um, not only is it difficult with regard to the question of dialects as opposed to languages, it's also uh, quite uh, difficult um, if we try to ethnicize uh, the whole problem, because yes, um, the Valuf Circle is of course a Russian imperial um, reaction uh, to uh, some things we will be talking about here, uh, but uh, let's not forget that uh, another ethnic Russian, and in fact one of the early um, serious linguists, uh, Ismail Sreznevsky, wrote the following in the year 1834. As of today, 1834, as of today, it need not to be proven to anyone or anything that Ukrainian, or as others prefer labeling it, Little Russian, is a language and not a dialect of Russian or Polish, as some have argued. But can it, or shall it, in the current situation continue its development and turn into a language of literature, this is what we heard about, and then of society, which is maybe even more important, as was partially the case earlier, so it did exist. Or is it doomed to stay forever a language of the simple folk, to unceasingly degenerate, to gradually wither and die away between the thorns of other languages? This was a key question um, asked in 1834. And this is a key question to which Ukrainians had to find uh, some answers. And their answers were quite convincing. And that's why the Bolduyev Circular was issued in the end. That would be one of my main theses here. Um, but what did Sreznevsky really talk about? He lacked our contemporary terminology. But if we linguists do have the feeling that we talk about languages with some justification, with some uh, grounded arguments, then we have in mind so-called standard languages. Uh, the definition of a standard language um, might be uh, put as such in a quite simplified way. Standard languages <coughs> are super dialectal languages with codified norms used in all societal domains disseminated and accepted among all members of the envisioned speech community. In a certain setting, anything that would not be developed into a standard language uh, was threatened to be labeled as a jargon, a patois, a dialect, not to be recognized as a language. Uh, the concept of a standard language was developed in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, in Prague, by the Prague Linguistic School, but <clears throat> let's be honest, what did the, those linguists do? They just found a way to describe what actually had been done in the 19th century. And it had not been done in a naive way. It had not been done in an unconscious way. 
it had been done in a very conscious way. All these people who we will now be talking about knew perfectly what a standard language is, although they did not use the term, because they made just these steps that were described later. And in this respect, one might recall uh, that um, already as early as uh, in the context of the uh, Brotherhood of uh, St. Cyril and Methodius, uh, it was not only about politics, it was, it was also um, about language. And what uh, the members of the um, society had really planned was, uh, in the end, but not in the least run, uh, the plan to spread native language education, Ukrainian language education. And this was, of course, a key concept in that context. But uh, all you know about, um, all of you know about um, the fate of the um, society, of the Brotherhood. Um, but it was not the end. After the Crimean War, everything set in again, and it set in uh, with um, quite a vigor. And here, uh, I would like to focus on some texts which uh, our histories of the Ukrainian language usually do not really turn uh, much attention to, although, as I think, uh, they should. And um, also, I will not talk a lot about uh, literature, but more about that aspect uh, which uh, Czesniewski uh, emphasized uh, as the second very important issue. Uh, not the development of the language of literature, but the development of the language of society, you remember. And in that regard, such innocent uh, books as uh, a simple primer can be of major importance. And in that regard, we notice the following. Uh, right after the Crimean War, uh, quite important things um, are realized. Uh, on the one hand, we have, um, as for uh, very, uh, very modest uh, uh, beginning of codification, uh, for instance, Pantelem Krish Zapiski Ayuzhny Rusi, which are written in Russian, but Kulish, in that regard, introduced a new orthography. And this orthography was, of course, a political statement, because this orthography distanced Ukrainian from Russian, and that's why the Russian Empire, not in 1863, but in 1876, reacted with a ban of the Kulishivka, as all of you know. But then there was uh, this even more important step, as I would say. Uh, it was Kulish Hramatka, which is uh, ill studied. And in this uh, Hramatka, uh, Kulish also formulates a program which reads uh, as such. Skilko ne jest u nas po Ukrainie, Hramatok i Bukvari. To vsi vone ne hodjaca nam dla pervoj nauke pismenstva, bo pečatani ne našojo mobojo. Temi pismenstvo ne duže širice v nas pomiš ljudmi. And this Ramatka, this primer, is in fact very interesting in that it not only introduces uh, its readers to literacy, it also contains, which is not so well known, prayers written in Ukrainian. It also uh, contains calculations formulated in Ukrainian. So Ukrainian became a language of society, which is, was a very important thing. Moreover, this innocent primer uh, offered a mapping of the Ukrainian linguistic space. <coughs> and in this regard, uh, I would like to emphasize only briefly that even prior uh, to the bans of 1863 and 1863, 76, Kulish in particular, but his contemporaries as well in the Russian Empire, were very well aware of what was going on in Galicia. And they paid great attention to what was happening in Galicia across <coughs> the border. Moreover, it is interesting that as soon as this was possible, uh, not only political work, but also uh, the work of language building was institutionalized to a certain degree. If we talk about Romadas of these years, 
then one of the major intentions was, again, the spread of literacy and the uh, production of Ukrainian language books. And they had quite tricky concepts of how they would do it, because let's not forget that language is partially uh, given by nature and by God, but uh, it is, to the same extent, a product of very hard work. Language is a phenomenon that uh, requires some efforts to develop these languages into standard languages again. On the eve of uh, 1863, in 1861, something very important happened, and uh, many of you have heard about that, I think. Uh, the same Kulish translated the manifesto which uh, proclaimed the abolition of serfdom in the Russian Empire into Ukrainian. And although the manifesto was not um, published, and that was Kulish's fault, not the empire's fault, it gave a perfect proof that Ukrainian could be used quite, quite convincingly to uh, write official documents in that dialect that did not exist, does not exist, and cannot exist. Moreover, on the eve of 1863, a person called Filip Orochevsky uh, translated the Gospels into Ukrainian. So the Bible was around in Ukrainian, and as you know, this undoubtedly meant dignity for any language. If you have uh, the Bible written in a language, it cannot be merely a dialect. All this was happening, and all this, as you can see if you read the Blue Circular again, uh, disturbed many people. Uh, not so much because it was about the language that did not exist, that does not exist, and cannot exist, but uh, because it was about the language that was <coughs> actually developing quite powerfully. And it was uh, developing very powerfully, uh, very powerfully within um, a very brief period of time. Right? We are talking about a few years again. And that's, by the way, quite typical of Ukrainian. There were always uh, some very few brief periods when Ukrainian could develop very powerfully. And this was one of them. One of the cornerstones of the development of the Ukrainian language as well was the foundation um, and um, the circulation of Osnova, the first Ukrainian thick journal. Um, and um, I think that uh, Osnova deserves to be uh, carefully studied again from the point of view um, of the study of the history of the Ukrainian language. First, Osnova offers very interesting language debates, uh, which partly um, anticipate what happened later. For instance, Zhitetsky, in his reply, to Vladimir Lamansky's uh, article, National Tactlessness, um, reacted to the reproach that uh, Ukrainians were Russian anyway. After all, many of them had adopted Russian without any problems. Zhitetsky said the following, yes, that's true, but others had assimilated with the Poles. What can we say about them? Moreover, Zhitetsky remembered uh, a couple of so-called Afranzuzhene Ruskie, that is Russians who knew French much better than Russian. What about them? Were they French? Kulish, in his reply to the letter from the South, reacted to the reproach that Ukrainian literature did not convey uh, genuine knowledge. Kulish reacted in a quite cool way. He said the development of Ukrainian was in fact, a quite recent phenomenon. But let's remember how Russian had developed. Russian was not a century-old standard language at that time. Russian uh, had required all these efforts too. If one wants to go that way, one could even say that by 1863, Russian had not really developed into a 
fully standardized language. There were some problems. Um, Kulish also referred to Kalisha in a very, very interesting way, as I would say, because as early as 1861, he wrote the following, and I will now read in Russian, if you allow. Вы забывайте о Галиции, где школьное преподавание судопроизводства идут на общедоступном южно-русском языке. У нас в украинской литературе преобладает отчасти по необходимости направление билетаристическое. У них реально. Ни то, ни другое не останется без плодотворных последствий. Обменяться недолго, лишь бы открылась материальная возможность. So, they knew quite well what was going on in Galicia. They uh, were aware of the fact that Galicia uh, was the space where some things were being done that could not be done in the Russian Empire um, at that time. And moreover, there was the clear plan to collaborate across the border. And this is what actually happened. And it happened prior to the rise of the concept of Galicia as Ukraine's Piedmont. So, there was another last point made by Kulish, which I should briefly mention, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, these people were not naive at all. We already see it. It's not uh, the story of uh, people with fantasies who were dreaming only of the Ukrainian language. They were also quite aware of uh, the need to fund the development of the Ukrainian language, and they also discussed the establishment of literacy societies um, and uh, knew that they depended also on such prosaic things as money. Osnova was uh, a platform where um, the use of the Ukrainian language was defended in a quite convincing way. Uh, and with very interesting arguments. Uh, but it was also in itself a platform for the development of the Ukrainian language. And it was designed as such a platform for the development of the Ukrainian language very consciously. So one of the editorials of Osnova says the following. We regard as necessary and generally useful the further development of the Ukrainian national language and literature. The question whether our literature should or should not exist has until recently been a topic of discussion for many. But life itself has decided it positively. On the one hand, people were already quite confident. On the other hand, to write in Ukrainian or to use Ukrainian in some context was not that easy. So, for instance, some <coughs> Ivan Novitsky tells us the following, and I will now read in Ukrainian. I think it should be read in Ukrainian. Давно вже зібрався я заговорити до вас нашою рідною українською мовою. Та все боявся, щоб не вийшло воно. Як от часом не прогнівайтесь, буває в основі. Дуже роблене, коване. Але, думаю собі, вовка боятись, то й в ліс не йти. Треба спробувати. And they did that quite well, as I would say. If you take a look at the language of Osnova and uh, of the Ukrainian language as used beyond Osnova, uh, without the institutional support, uh, even despite the first intrigues against the Ukrainian project, what we see is a quite <coughs> unified language which is uh, really uh, quite surprising, although we know that um, the Ukrainian dialects within the Russian Empire do not differ that significantly from each other. And um, people who contributed to Osnova and who took part in that process, um, again, knew very well that it was not only about literature, although literature was a very important thing, Alexander Kornoisky, for instance, 
put it like that. Osnova, the whole journal, powinna buty na nasi ukraińskiej mowie. Ukraińska mowa godzi nie dla odnich wierszy. Na jej i teper można mówić i pisać pro wse nasze taktyki, jak i na inszych. That was the struggle that was going on. Apart from that, Osnova was a platform uh, where concrete measures of standardization were wonderful, uh, were discussed. So, they were not only discussed, though they were partly also uh, decided, so to speak. The editorial of one of the issues uh, suggests uh, laissez-faire uh, access to the Ukrainian language as used in Osnova. Uh, but although Ukrainian dialects are quite homogeneous, as far as southeastern and northern dialects are concerned, still some regulations have to take place. And that's why someone else, again, Alexander Konyski, uh, makes this further step. He selects the dialectal basis, uh, which seem to be uh, the most appropriate one. Jak za lutszą mowę najbliższ uważajcie poltawsko czy hyrynska, to brać się ostatnio, zostawiać swoją mowę dla drugiego dzieła, dla sporudzenia ukraińskiej ogólnej mowy. Osnowa, as you all remember, had many materials in Russian, and some of the most important uh, texts were written in Russian anyway. Um, this can have to do something with the fact that um, not everybody of these authors dared to write in Ukrainian in those cases, but there would be some examples of intellectual texts which were written in Ukrainian anyway. If we ask ourselves why Dvieruskie Narodnosti or uh, many other key texts were written in Russian, we should also think about uh, the question to whom uh, these um, articles uh, were addressed. It was not only Ukrainian-speaking persons, so uh, it was also, of course, a question of the recipients of those texts. Now let us take a brief look, and I'm already concluding, uh, concluding at um, the accusations which were put forth regarding the Ukrainian movement and the uh, project of uh, elaborating the Ukrainian language. What did Russian imperial authorities and what did Russian nationalists write about the Ukrainian language on the eve of 1863. They complained that the Ukrainians approach the simple folk, teach it literacy, and that they run a journal, Osnova, which is written in Ukrainian. They complain about the education of the popular masses in Ukrainian. They complain about the translation of the Holy Writ, and they fear what Nikolai Anenkov, one of the officials, formulated as such. Having succeeded in the translation of the Holy Writ into the Little Russian dialect, aside from all these other processes, the adherents of the Little Russian party will achieve, so to speak, the acknowledgement of the distinct Little Russian language. Subsequently, they will not stop at this point and announce, based on the separate language, their aspirations for Little Russia's autonomy. Language was, of course, linked with politics. We will hear about that much more in the next talk. But language as such is important, too. Uh, I think um, if I have a few seconds, I should anyway uh, quote Kostomarov um, to conclude. Uh, it will be in Russian, um, but it is very wise, and um, it confirms what I said uh, when I began this talk. Gran, mirstutiam, 
что называется наречием и что языком, вы не проведете, господа, по одним и тем же признакам. Для вас наречие, для нас язык. Вам не нравится малорусское наречие? На здоровье вам. А вам оно нравится. Thank you. Thank you.